everyone and welcome this evening to another webinar session part of the Living Coast Discovery Center Second Nature. Uh, tonight we're going to be talking all about building your backyard habitats and making it uh, great for all of our native wildlife and so we've got a wonderful lineup of panelists this evening. Before we do get started with our panelists we do want to send a shout out to our sponsors U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service part of the Urban Wildlife Refuge partnership that we have with them for helping to put together this awesome series. For those of you joining us this evening, it is part of our second nature series. It's actually our last webinar, and we have eight wonderful videos, including one that correlates to this one called Cultivating Habitats, um, that you can go check out on our website, thelivingcoast.org backslash Black backslash second nature. So um, without further ado, I'm gonna introduce our panelists uh, this evening. We have Judy Linser from the California Nature Plant Society. We have Dylan Jones, a local biologist, and we have Miss Mallory, um, who is a local conservationist and, um, and uh, I don't even know how to describe, uh, all on social media and, and media. So um, we're gonna kick it off with Miss Mallory. Um, and so let me, tell you a little bit more about her uh, through her work on network television, social media, and our very own KUSI Good Morning San Diego. Miss Mallory's mission is to spark curiosity about wildlife conservation and backyard exploration while empowering others to do the same through public outreach, community projects, and citizen science scientist initiatives. So Mallory, thanks so much for being here this evening with us. Oh, thank you so much for having me and thank you for setting up this amazing opportunity to kind of get people excited about um, working more in their own backyards and hopefully bringing our backyard wildlife to us. Awesome, so we're gonna go ahead and start. I'm gonna share a screen real quick. So let's see. So as mentioned, um, I'm Miss Mallory I'm from Miss Mallory Adventures, the online education platform that really tries to get people excited about, especially the creepy, crawly, gross and scary things, not only in our backyards, but across the world. And I travel around with scientists and basically do conservation storytelling. And through these um, really amazing initiatives and projects, I've been able to learn so much about kind of the animals that many of us appreciate but we don't really realize how um, much in peril they are and the ones that we're going to be talking about today are our western monarch butterflies if you've never heard of the species i'm sure you've seen of um, seen them before so there are two essential populations of the monarch butterflies many of us know about the ones that do these really epic migrations down to mexico for their wintering um, houses or homes if you will but we also have a Western population that comes over to places like San Diego and they overwinter there. Unfortunately, since the 1980s, our population, it says, has now less than 1% of the historic numbers. Unfortunately, after our Thanksgiving monarch count, we are now thinking that it's dropped 99.9%, .9%, which is really devastating uh, for such a beautiful, beautiful animal. And one especially that makes these crazy, crazy long journeys. And what's really, really cool about this butterfly species is that it takes multiple generations for them to make this migration. So there's many, many generations that go from their wintering home to their summer home. And then there's one it's called migration generation that makes this crazy long journey all the way back into, um, in our case, the San Diego area to overwinter. If you look at the graphs below, you can see the Thanksgiving count and you can see the populations have been drastically declining more and more. This year, many were wondering if our populations were showing a decrease because of COVID and people not getting out. Unfortunately, not only did they go down, but also we were able to get even more volunteers to look at even more overwintering places. And so even though we were able to discover more overwintering areas, our populations have dropped even more. But as just disheartening as that sounds, there is something that we can do. So one of my favorite websites to learn more about the Western Monarch population is Xerxes. Um, it's X, I have it on here, I thought, but xerxes.org. 
and they give some really great recommendations to help our Western monarch population. Um, it's to protect and manage um, our overwintering sites, of course. We have one over by UCSD, if you guys ever would like to see one. Unfortunately, last time I went, I didn't see very many, but you can see in the upper left-hand corner, they will gather and kind of cluster almost like grapes. So it's a really amazing site if you can see. So hopefully we can all create our backyards to invite them more and to give them the energy they need to make these migrations and hopefully repopulate. One of the, and of course, I don't wanna just reach you guys. So if you guys wanna go ahead and read through that. Um, where is the site at UCSD? It is the um, area where the eucalyptus, eucalyptus grove is. It might be UCSD or USD, sorry. Um, it's one of those two campuses, but it has the eucalyptus grove. So not only will monarch butterflies go in native trees, but they have been um, historically found in our, the eucalyptus as well. And you can see those guys typically from November all the way through February. But the one, the biggest impact that we can make, and I'm going to be very kind of vague and very broad with this. I, we only have 10 minutes, so I want to make sure we get in the most important information possible. But it's mainly that we need to provide early blooming pollinating flowers, or so nectar flowers, for these animals as they begin to kind of come out of their winter sleep, if you will. And start getting ready to make these migrations back to their summer areas and start to breed and start to lay eggs. And most of, unfortunately, a lot of flowers won't start coming out until it's a little bit warmer um, when the rains come, which can be later on. So February through April is really important part. Also, we want to really emphasize native plants, um, especially native milkweed, as we know, Monarch butterflies will only, they have a host plant and this host plant is very important. They have kind of evolved with each other so that the caterpillars are able to use the, I don't wanna say toxic defenses, but you know, all plants have this defense to kind of deter animals from eating them. Well, the monarch butterfly and its caterpillar has been able to evolve to not only not be harmed by that toxin, but also utilize it as a defense. So they will only really want to lay eggs on these uh, native milkweeds. Unfortunately, they will sometimes lay eggs on tropical milkweeds. Unfortunately, we are starting to know that this is causing a lot of disease with our monarchs and causing a lot of problems with the populations as well. Not only that, our tropical milkweeds won't die back in the winter. And so it kind of messes with their natural cycle because they're, they have access to this food during wintering times, it will get them to start breeding a little bit earlier and they don't have enough energy or they're awake when it's too cold and there's a lot of issues that are going on. So we want to make sure that we try to keep things as natural as possible. Milkweed and native pollinating plants are truly beautiful. So it's really great to learn how to landscape with these native stuff. If I plant milkweed, so I have a question. It says, if I plant milkweed or another pollinator, will the caterpillars eat my nearby fruit trees and other plants like herbs and berries? So not monarchs. Monarchs, are, um, caterpillars are only going to want to eat milkweed. Again, that evolutionary kind of um, relationship that was created. And um, if tropical is cut back, it cannot harbor um, that. Yes, um, that's what I've heard as well. Um, I'm, again, I'm not um, extremely uh, knowledgeable as far as like a scientist wise. I do more of the citizen science, but these are the ones that these are the conservation impact tools that we have been really trying to advocate for. So thank you for that tip as well. Uh, one of my favorites, so I do citizen science. That is my biggest uh, passion in life is to get people who maybe aren't part of the science community involved and making them feel like they're making an impact for our native species. And so one of my favorite citizen science app for monarch butterflies and for native milkweeds is called Monarch SOS. And I have a screenshot of some of the really amazing tools that it provides. Not only can you help record or report, do surveys, 
Um, but it also will tell you about the anatomy of the animals as well as lookalikes, um, the plants in certain regions that you can plant to help. Um, I, someone also recommended iNaturalist. iNaturalist is really great for insects. However, I do want to say if you do have any kind of sensitive animals, like um, for instance, in your area that may be good for, that may open the door for poachers. I, I also work with US Fish and Wildlife Services and a few other um, governmental agencies. And we have noticed that iNaturalist is being used for poachers. So, or by poachers, I should say. So if uh, insects, plants, all that stuff is really great. But if you happen to come across something that's kind of sensitive or could be possibly placed on the black market, we do ask you not to put any of those things in iNaturalist, um, but really great suggestion as well. Um, Western Milkweed Mapper Project on iNaturalist. Awesome, yeah, so stuff like that is really fantastic. But that is basically my, uh, let's see, we'll stop if I can see my arrow. So that is it for today, um, what I have. So I hit the 11 minute mark, sorry, I was right over, but hopefully um, someone learned stuff from it. No, that was great. Thanks, Ms. Mallory. And it, and it definitely looks like people are using that Q&A feature that we do have activated. So um, good job, everyone. And for those of you just joining us, uh, if you do have a question for any of our panelists this evening, you can uh, go ahead and use that Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. And we will either answer it live or at the very end, we are going to bring back all three panelists to just toss up some other questions that the group might have for them. Uh, so thank you, Mallory. So what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and move on to our next speaker, Dylan, Dylan Jones. He's a local biologist and science communicator, and he is interested in telling stories about evolution in the natural world. Dylan's research has ranged from tracking mud turtles in the jungles of Belize to inferring the shared evolutionary history of middle American reptiles and amphibians. Dylan believes that cultivating community and learning adventurously are the best ways to communicate science to the public. So Dylan, thanks so much for being here with us this evening. For sure. Thanks for having me. Um, let me see. Okay. Let's, let's see if we can figure out this screen share. It's okay. If I hit screen two. I think that works, right? You see, you there see you a little, go. right? Cool. Cool. So yeah, today I'm, um, like, like my, the wonderful introduction, uh, I'm a biologist and a science communicator. So today I'm going to talk about backyard habitat for reptiles and amphibians. And I thought what better way to start it off than with a picture of an alligator lizard that I found in my backyard, um, I think right at the start of the pandemic. So uh, I always like to start these things off with who am I? Like I said, biologist, science communicator. Here in San Diego, I am currently in the Masters of Evolutionary Biology program at San Diego State University. So my research is always focused on reptiles and amphibians, but in very different ways. I've done everything from urban herpetology surveys where we go into local parks and try to figure out what species are found there to tracking turtles um, with these uh, little radio telemetry tags. It's sort of like uh, having a metal detector, but for turtles to some of the stuff I'm doing now, which is these big data projects that involve biogeography or just trying to figure out where our species and why are they where they're at. But today's presentation is really going to focus on one, a past project uh, that I did in an urban setting because we live in an urbanized world and I think it's important to talk about wildlife in the cities. Then go into some of the benefits of backyard wildlife and then how can you actually create and maintain that backyard habitat. So the project that I'm specifically talking about, we just got it published early this year and we basically went into this urban nature sanctuary in the heart of Houston, Texas. I did my undergraduate degree at Texas A&M, so Houston, Texas wasn't too far of a shot for me. But this was a little park called Edith L. Moore Nature Sanctuary. It was the headquarters of the Houston Audubon, and it's only about 18 acres completely surrounded by development. We always joked that this was a park that was basically surrounded by McMansions, highways, and essentially more and more development. 
But what was really incredible is that despite this being such a small park with so much urbanization around it, we found about 24 species of reptiles and amphibians over the course of around six months. And if you look at some of the citizen and community science data, you'll see that there are, again, in this very small park, about 100 species of plants and about 150 species of mammals, birds, reptiles, amphibians, and fish. So it's a very, very concentrated area of diversity. And part of what I was looking at there and trying to understand more was why are they so successful? Now, this was a bit hard to quantify, but what I really saw coming into play um, was the fact that they involved the community. Every time I went there, there were community volunteers, neighbors essentially, coming in and helping plant uh, native plants, helping remove weeds, helping to make the park a better habitat for the wildlife that live there. And they focused on those natural habitats. They were really big on keeping dirt trails. They were really big on removing invasive species. They were really big on trying to keep it as natural and uh, as wild as possible. But they also really encouraged backyard wildlife with their neighbors. And I think this was one of the most important things because yes, the park is, a, it's a sanctuary. It is a safe area for wildlife to exist in. But um, wildlife can't read signs. They don't know the boundaries of the park. They exist uh, beyond that park. So by having this backyard wildlife, you're more or less increasing the area that wildlife can live in. But this is, of course, an isolated case, right? This is, this is Houston, Texas. This is a single park. It had lots of funds. But how does that actually relate to what we're talking about here, San Diego backyard wildlife? Well, if you just go onto Google Maps and look at some of our parks, you're going to see very similar patterns where we have our parks like Ticalote Canyon, like Dictionary Hill, like Mission Trails. They are completely surrounded by development. They're surrounded by houses. They're surrounded by businesses. They are surrounded by humans, essentially. You can't, it's sometimes hard to go walking in Ticalote without hearing a barbecue or uh, people having like a great afternoon. And that's awesome. It's awesome that we can exist with wildlife and nature at such a close proximity. So whenever we're creating backyard habitats, whenever we're creating space for wildlife to exist in the backyard, what we're really doing is helping conservation. We're able to have these parks that protect wildlife, that give them habitat. And by having backyard habitat as well, we're increasing the area uh, that the wildlife can be in. But there's also some other benefits, right? Like natural pest control. If you have lots of bugs in your backyards, I can guarantee these lizards will just go to town and <laughs> eat a bunch of them. Uh, these are two different lizards that I watched uh, pretty much during my entire time in, uh, in the pandemic in my backyard. I gave them names. They all have personalities. The one on the top was Fuego Diego because he's well lives in San Diego and he was always in the hottest part of the backyard. And um, the one below, that, that's a lizard myth. Little Liz is what we called her. She's just, she's just awesome. She such, has such a cool personality. So that, that last bullet point, the personal enjoyment, that's really what I get out of um, having really great backyard habitat. Being able to literally walk outside in my backyard, wearing my pajamas and seeing wildlife. But you can't just have wildlife, you need to actually create some habitat for it, right? And this is where I'm going to move into that last sort of part of this presentation of how do we actually create habitat. First thing I'm always going to say is add some logs, add some rocks, add just cover. Um, logs are usually what I prefer. I just like the look of logs. It's purely personal bias, but any type of cover will work really well. In fact, some of the best areas in my backyard are these uh, raised planters that we have. And it's really nothing more than cinder blocks and plywood that we found on the side of the road. The lizards are always there. I'm always finding little critters underneath the cinder blocks. So anything that can create cover, places for wildlife to hide, to get away from the, from the bearing sun during a heat wave, um, cover is king. Now, if you wanna get a little bit fancier and attract different wildlife than just lizards, um, small ponds actually are awesome. I love small ponds. They're super, super easy to make. In a lot of cases, you can just dig out a ditch, put down some liner and 
fill it up with water. Um, if you're worried about mosquitoes, anything like that, if, if you're keeping the water circulating, if you throw in um, some native fish, some small fish, sometimes it actually really helps with it. Or you have frogs that get attracted. This is a little uh, Baja California tree frog that I caught calling at one of the local parks here. And they almost always find these little ponds. Personally, I like hearing frog calls at night. So always a big fan of little ponds. Now you can also make insect hotels. These are super, super popular. I will always say you do need to do um, a little bit of research to make sure that you are um, creating insect hotels for the right species. But for reptiles and amphibians, I think of these as um, lizard restaurants. So just to kind of wrap this up, um, what do you do once you actually have the habitat? I will always say monitor what you find. Um, I do use iNaturalist quite a bit, but for sensitive species, be very, very particular about it. If it's sensitive at all, a lot of times I don't iNaturalist it because uh, privacy. If you want to keep your own home private, you can, make a, you can make it a hidden observation, you can make it a very large range, but it's a really great way to actually track what you're finding in your own backyard. Always encourage others, share what you're finding. I've had many hour long conversations about what someone has found in their backyard. And then adapt, maintain and enjoy. I always love this last little bit because it's never gonna work the first time and that's perfectly fine. If you need to plant different plants, if you need to remove something, if you need to um, just change something to keep it going, that's perfectly okay. So I always like to, end it with that. That's actually the end of my presentation. Now I was trying to look at the chat and the Q&A and for some reason it would not pop up for me. So I'm going to, maybe if I stop sharing, it'll work. Um, <laughs> well, so one, there was one question about um, just how, how best to learn how to use iNaturalist because this attendee said it, it seems complicated sometimes. Yeah, it, it, it can be super complicated uh, when you're starting out. So we're actually doing like a me and a bunch of other people are doing this month long like a naturalist challenge and a lot of them have started out like using it for the very first time so there are some really great resources on the website and if you're not sure what the species are i naturalist makes it really easy because they give you suggestions um, at the end of the day you take a picture with it and upload it on the app or on the mobile website whichever is easier for you um, personally i use it to learn my plants because i do not know my plants in the slightest <laughs> No, that's a great a great tip and also a great transition to our last uh, speaker. So um, thanks so much, Dylan. We'll have you back on in just a few minutes, but I do wanna get to our last speaker, uh, Judy Linzer, who's from the California um, Native Plant Society and she's a naturalist educator. So Judy has been a classroom teacher and taught preschool and high school for more than 20 years. She's currently a naturalist um, and an active board member of the San Diego Children in Nature, um, as well as leading after school programs for the San Diego Audubon Society. She also has coordinated the native plant workshops and the annual native plant tours for CNSP or CNPS and, um, and even has her own native garden. Um, so thanks Judy so much for, for being here this evening. Yes, excited to be here. <laughs> So um, I just want to piggyback on what both Dylan and Mallory said, you know, just talking about the, the critical importance of having native plants in our backyards, um, because again, that's what has evolved and what belongs and what native species are dependent on. So um, if you can see, I have a certified wildlife habitat and I would encourage other people to look into doing that through the National Wildlife Federation. Um, it's pretty easy to do and you get this great sign and it's a great way to um, show off to your neighbors that you're making wildlife habitat an important part of your, um, your garden. So I'm a naturalist educator and I also coordinate tours for the California Native Plant Society for their, um, for their native garden tour and I'm also a workshop director. So I spend a lot of time out in nature educating people about the importance of California natives. And I like to point out, do you see these children here? So nobody paid them to look excited and enthusiastic about um, native plants. Um, but when you get kids outside and you're teaching them about um, all kinds of animals and plants and showing them up close and personally, um, it, it's very exciting for them. Hey, Judy, um, your screen share isn't showing yet. It isn't? Yeah. Oh, okay. 
Apologies. Okay, is it showing now? Mm. Oh, it's starting to load. There okay. you go. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay, can everyone see it now? Yes, good to go. Okay, so again, here's a certified wildlife habitat. There's me in nature, not having to pay the kids to look excited because again, hands-on learning is a wonderful way to get connected with the environment. So um, this is a picture of my front yard and um, I have no irrigation whatsoever in the front. And I like to say that my, even without any irrigation, I have the mo most lush garden on the street. Um, this is in March and April when it looks this happy and exciting with all of the wildflowers, but even when the wildflowers die back, there's still a lot of um, native habitat there that's you know fantastic as um, a host for lots of different pollinators and other animals. So what is habitat? It's basically um, providing plants for food, shelter so that animals can reproduce, and water. And um, we're going to be looking at some different features as we go along. So benefits of native plants. So of course they're creating habitat um, and they're very low water. So they have been evolved in our um, this climate. So therefore they don't need a lot of water. It's not that they need no water at all. Of course they depend on their the winter rains. And in the summer, just to keep the garden looking a little happier, um, I will water about once every three weeks for a couple of hours with a sprinkler system. Not a sprinkler system, but I'll put a sprinkler up. Um, and they attract native birds, pollinators, and other animals. And of course they're diverse and beautiful and they are what belong. And um, the other thing is we, you know, so many people have lawns and lawns are just devoid of any kind of habitat whatsoever. They take three to four times the amount of water, even more um, in, in many ways. And if you replace your lawn and there are lots of lawn rebates out there, um, you can have the opportunity to really be doing something for the environment. Um, so here we have native plants live here. And if you look, I believe it's on your left as well. Um, it's kind of in the middle of that picture. There's a little um, bird bath, keep that filled with water. Um, that's what I used at the beginning for birds. I had a couple of small bird baths. And as we move on further, you'll see that I have a very big water feature in my backyard. Um, upper right hand corner are some chalk leaf Dudleyas and some elegant Clarkia and of course the California poppy. Um, so you can see it's just absolutely gorgeous. There's some agaves on the bottom. Um, and then uh, right where the native plants live here is something called uh, Rogers red grape. And it's a wonderful, wonderful habitat plant. So uh, besides creating habitat for animals, we're also creating habitat for humans. And you know, one of the things that I really encourage people um, to think about is that just being outside in your garden does lots of wonderful things for you. It can cut anxiety and depression. There are a lot of cultures that really encourage um, people, especially in Japan, to go out and enjoy um, what they call forest bathing, because again, it's a de-stressor. It can increase concentration and creativity. Of course, there's great exercise, vitamin D. It's thrilling. It can be calming, inspirational, relaxing. So I just really encourage people to look at it as habitat for humans as well. Um, I just love this quote. Uh, you should sit in nature for 20 minutes a day, unless you're busy, then of course you should sit for an hour. So again, I think it's just a really good thing for our psyche as well. So uh, I say, welcome FBI. So in this case, the FBI stands for fungus, bacteria, and invertebrates, um, which are also critically important. You couldn't have plants without fungus, bacteria, and invertebrates. So I just want to encourage um, people who are creating native backyards or just native spaces. Uh, like Dylan said, you do want to have, it's a good idea to have piles of logs and just other places where um, fungus and insects, you know, different kinds of animals um, can have a space to live and shelter. Um, so benefits of insects and how to attract them. So calscape.org and cnpssd.org. CNPSSD stands for California Native Plant Society. And these are two websites with lots of information. Calscape.org lists every plant that's available in all of California, and it tells when it blooms, what areas it's endemic to, uh, 
what color the flower is going to be, what kinds of pollinators visit it, whether it likes decomposed granite or a more organic kind of a mulch. So it's just chock full of information on plants and also calscape.org also now covers information on butterflies and moths. So again, native plants are critically important for all of these reasons. Um, so the life cycle of a butterfly. So this is a Gulf fritillary butterfly in my backyard. If you see in the upper right hand corner, there's the tiny little egg that's growing. And on the left side, that butterfly is on what's called a buckwheat gigantum. And the bottom right side is a uh, tiger swallowtail caterpillar. It's actually on fennel. It's not on a native plant. But again, these are all in my backyard and I just wanted to share them. So of course you have the different life cycles of the different insects uh, in your garden as well. So here we have the monarch butterfly. If you look at the bottom, you see the egg, of course turns into the larva, then the pupa, and then into the adult. Um, on the left side, you have the, um, again, the Gulf fritillary and it's going into its um, chrysalis phase there on the upper left side. And again, these pictures were taken in the backyard. So there's just a ton of habitat available um, for all of these insects. Life cycle of a ladybug. So a lot of people don't know what ladybug larva looks like. So if you look at that big picture on the right hand side, that is what a ladybug larva looks like. And I know a lot of people, this is one of the things I love to say, people might see an insect like this and they go, ew, and I say, no, change the shape of your mouth, go, ooh, makes you sound more intelligent, it expands your brain. And you might not have known that this is what a ladybug looks like before it becomes a ladybug. But just again, keep in mind that um, there's just a whole world out there that you might not understand, but let's make it work for you. And um, underneath that um, ladybug larva, you see some aphids. So yes, um, ladybugs are critically important for eating aphids. So again, you've got that like complete little ecosystem thing there. So I wanna encourage you to, um, you know, just have an open mind about what's in your garden. And if you see something you're not sure about, please, um, yes, use iNaturalist or use the Seek app, take pictures, um, be a community scientist. Everything that you take a picture of gets logged to the San Diego Natural History Museum and to other sites. So it's a great way to um, participate and get some great answers. Um, this is a praying mantis um, egg case. And uh, of course, praying mantises are wonderful because they are predators for lots of um, pesty insects. So this praying mantis egg case, um, there were hatchlings in my garden and uh, very exciting. They're teeny tiny. And of course they are very beneficial as well. Uh, so here, um, as I mentioned, initially I had some small uh, water, just like places with water in them for bird baths. And about five years ago, I turned my pool into a pond. So out with the toxic chemicals, in with the algae, um, added a few different species of fish and just have this beautiful habitat. So I always say that I never said, oh, I'm gonna go have tea by the pool or I'm gonna go have a glass of wine by the pool, but I am outside constantly. It's a little wildlife sanctuary. If anyone's interested in doing something like this, I'm available um, to give information on it. Um, I know several people in San Diego who have gone this route. Um, it's wonderful as a backyard habitat for attracting birds. Uh, if you could see that giant net at the top, um, that net is there because I had some osprey come and take away a little creamsicle, one of one of my koi. Um, I've also had um, egrets. I'll show you. Yeah, there you have an egret um, that came and again did some fishing. Comes and gets some minnows. But really, I mean, you you can just see how beautiful it is, how tranquil. And I'd also like to point out a lot of people say, do you use your your pond? Do you ever get in? And of course, I get in to do pond maintenance, and I also get in to swim. So you can do laps in a swimming pond as well. Um, so again, it's just a wonderful way to um, utilize a backyard in a different manner. So again, here's our little uh, egret. And then guess this critter. So about just a couple of weeks after um, I stopped chlorinating, I saw these things swimming in the pond. I didn't know what they were, contacted a biologist. And these are actual dragonfly larva or nymphs. And they were swimming in the pond. So dragonflies would come and lay their eggs. If you have a chlorinated pool, of course the egg cannot survive. But when you have a non-chlorinated pool, um, then you have dragonfly nymphs that actually hatch and live and swim around. 
and they're voracious eaters as well. They eat um, mosquito larvae, as do a lot of the other small fish that I have. And about six weeks later, after these guys were introduced, out came uh, dragonflies and damselflies. So on the bottom, you have a damselfly. Um, I'm sorry, on the bottom, you have a dragonfly. Uh, with its uh, wings spread out and the damselfly has its wings spread on the top. Um, so again, another way for native plants and native habitat to um, allow for native critters. Um, on the left here, there are two water collection containers that are collecting water. Um, I use these containers mostly to fill up the pond, but also for native plants. Um, right in front of that uh, window on the left is what's called a California fairy duster. I'm sorry, that's a Baja fairy duster, one of my favorite plants, wonderful for hummingbirds and lots of other pollinators. And um, it, it blooms year round, which is fantastic. And again, on the right hand side, you have the purple flower, which is a globelia, poppies, elegant clarkia, just lots of color and lots of habitat. So wildlife awareness, um, one thing to watch out for is bird crashes. So you can see that I have that little stencil of the owl on my window and the Cooper's hawk is on the other side of the window. Um, so yeah, I just would really encourage people to really be aware of that and whatever you can do to protect your habitat because birds will actually see a reflection in the window and might think that it's a plant and crash into your window. So just something to have on your radar. Um, so we wanted to make you aware of that. Uh, so there are also lots of edibles. On the right-hand side there, that's miner's lettuce, which is a salady kind of a plant, um, very delicious. My grandson loves to graze in my garden. So there's lots of that growing. On the left side, the, the yellow plant is um, seat monkey flower. And amongst that, um, there's some um, watercress. I also grow holly leaf cherries that are um, edible. And uh, yeah, so there are a lot of native plants that you can use also for consumption. And this is just another picture of my backyard. I'm sorry, that's my front yard. Uh, just to show how much habitat there is. Um, I have birds making nests all the time. And it's really interesting from when I went from Australian plants to California native plants, the number of species in my garden just went up exponentially. And when I walk down the street and I look and compare my garden to all of the other gardens, it's just incredible. So again, uh, great to encourage other people to think about doing this just to provide lots of habitat. Here's just a couple of other um, pictures. You've got some California sagebrush in the background and some other sages and some bladder pod, um, lots of beautiful things. Um, in that potted plant is a, a certain kind of a Dudleya that's also a native that looks beautiful in a pot. And uh, this is a, a quote that I think is so important. Ecosystems are not only more complex than we think, but they are more complex than we can think. So we are only scratching the surface, um, but we do know that whatever we can do in designing a garden and providing native plants is you know, one step forward. Um, as you can see, or many steps forward, as you can see, I tend to like a very wild look, but you can also have native plants that have more of a Japanese style. Um, they can be more um, groomed and trimmed. So there's lots of different styles that you can have. Again, I prefer the more wild look, but um, if you're interested in that, you can again, get on cnpssd.org. We have different um, information on plants that are the most successful plants if you're just starting out and other ideas about different designs that you might be interested in. Moving on, um, I just wanna say thank you for being interested um, and let's all work collectively to move forward. I wanna point out on the left, that's um, lemonade berry. Um, again, on the right, you've got the Gulf Fritillary butterfly. Um, it takes a village, so let's all stay connected and do whatever we can to uh, move this forward. So thank you. Thank you so much, Judy, for joining us this evening. And for those of you that were interested in Judy's presentation, um, our, uh, our video that pairs with this webinar called Cultivating Habitats actually features more of Judy's backyard and uh, more tips and tricks on how you can begin to create your own native spaces. So uh, thanks again, Judy, for being here. And there was actually a couple questions that were specifically kind of geared to what you were talking about um, at the beginning of your presentation, how you don't have any irrigation in the, in the front yard. Mm -hmm. And people were wondering, how do you establish your garden so that you don't have to irrigate um, and, and you're able to sustainably water your garden? Yeah, that's a great question. I actually, I'm going to grab a prop. 
Um, so initially when I put plants in, um, I, I dig a hole and I water the hole. I put in many, many, many gallons of water. So I'll fill up the hole and then I'll let it drain. I'll fill it up again and let it drain. So again, let's say at least 10 or 15 gallons of water over the course of a couple of hours. Then I put the plant in and there's a rule that a lot of people in native plants um, follow and that's water your plants every day for a week, every week for a month, and then every month for a year to establish them. Hmm. So when you're first getting them in, again, that's a good routine every day for every day for a week, every week for a month, every month for a year. Um, another thing is I have a very sophisticated drip system, <laughs> which uh, basically this is a just a uh, lemonade or tea bottle. And I put some holes in the bottom and I fill it up and I'll leave it next to the plant so it will slowly drip. So once a week after I've gotten to the every week, even at the beginning, I'll, I'll just leave a bottle like this to slowly let the water go soak the, the hole while the plant is in there. So I like this kind of drip system. And um, what else? Yeah, so it's just uh, initially there is some maintenance as far as watering, but you could take a hose and, and do your watering like that. And I actually don't have irrigation in either my front or my backyard. Um, but what I do is uh, every few weeks, besides so putting up a sprinkler and soaking for a couple of hours, I will also just take a sprinkler and I will just sprinkle water on them, just kind of get the dust off. That takes about 10 or 15 minutes. Um, I think it really just rejuvenates the plant and um, really helps it stay a little happier. You don't want to do that in the middle of the day. Best time to do that is in the early morning for watering as well. Ideally, you don't want to water at night because then the water sits there and it's more of an opportunity for bacteria to grow. So early morning is absolutely the best time to water your plants. So any other questions on that one, um, send, send them my way. Let me know. Great, thanks. And um, we'll get the other two panelists back um, because there were quite a few questions and um, our panelists have been very nice to uh, start answering some of the some of those questions. And um, there was definitely a lot of questions that kind of came in about the pond, um, which I know that Dylan and Judy both kind of touched on a little bit. Um, some questions about how to get it started. How do you keep it from evaporating? Um, where do you get native fish to put in it? So I don't know if um, Dylan or Judy want to kind of kind of answer on that and then the other one piggyback. Okay, well, I'll, I'll jump in. Um, so yes, there is absolutely evaporation just like there would be for a pool. Um, and one, one thing that helps with the evaporation is that I do have the shade cloths over the pond. So um, the shade cloths help, it keeps it a little bit cooler as well. Um, I do have some native plants in there. I also have some plants that aren't native. Um, but as far as fish, if I had a redo and I could do this over again, um, I, can you see me by the way? Mm -hmm. Okay, so if I had a redo, um, I would probably have researched what kinds of native fish to put in, but I ended up starting with koi. I have some hyphen sharks in there. I have some red rosy minnows, which are native, and I have some flatties um, and a couple of rescue turtles. Um, but if I, again, if I were going to do redo, I would consider looking into what other native fish were out there. I do know someone who's gone with crappy and bluegill and some rainbow trout kind of separated. Um, the only problem is I know that um, some of those fish can be a little aggressive. So when they get in the pond, uh, the fish, you know, will kind of bite them a little bit. Whereas my koi are very, I can get in, I can pet them. When I swim, they swim at my side. Um, so anyway, I would just encourage whoever might be interested in this, maybe talking to Dylan or doing some more research. But again, I, I don't have a lot of native fish, just the minnows. Or native. Yeah. Um, yeah. So Dylan, 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 what about you? Do you have any um, other tips or what about thinking about amphibians and stuff for your pond? Yeah. So, I mean, uh, I actually, with, with the native fish thing, I, the way I always got mine when I had a pond back in, well, this was back in Texas, but still applies here. Um, I had friends that worked in fisheries departments and I had friends that worked with the local, um, the local, like the fish club, basically. So they they were always helping me source them. Um, a lot of the small fish I got were the little, uh, basically minnows that you get for fishing um, that you would normally catch with like a little uh, bucket system. And those worked awesome for just, you know, eating mosquito eggs and whatnot. 
Um, but in, in terms of like ponds for amphibians, and I, this actually relates, there was a question about, can you use gray water for pond refilling? I, I always usually say no, like point like flat out because gray water can have things that are not safe for amphibians. Amphibians, they, they sort of breathe through their skin. So it's a little bit tricky um, if you give them water that has any chemicals in it. I know there are ways to treat gray water. I just don't know if it's amphibian safe to be quite honest. But yes, uh, ponds are certainly more difficult here in San Diego, but placing them in the shade helps a ton. Um, we actually had a sort of a pond growing for a while because our hose was leaking like crazy and we just didn't get it fixed for three months. So we I was like, I'll make a little pond. And you know, we, we, had, we had a few things get, get into there, mainly the birds liked it. Um, but yeah, there, there are absolutely ways to have ponds, but it, it could be tricky for sure. Yeah. Great, thanks. And um, so there was a question about invasive species, specifically on if aphids are invasive species or how you know if a species is invasive. Um, so I, I wouldn't think of, I mean, aphids certainly can reproduce very rapidly and that's why it's really good to have uh, ladybugs and other animals that will eat aphids. So I'm not sure if they'd be, I guess they'd be considered invasive, but they're still native and they're still part of an ecosystem. So, you know, we just want to keep them in check um, as best we can naturally. Dylan, you want to weigh in on that as well? Yeah, yeah. I always forget, because I know some aphid species, like this is getting super granular. I know some species fit that like technical, uh, non-native invasive, um, but yeah, keeping them in check, I mean, I like touching on natural ways to keep them in check, um, like other insects that are predators of aphids. That's what I like to use usually. Um, my specialty is definitely not insects. I, <laughs> so I'm always a bit not sure, to be quite honest. That's, that's okay. Um, and there was, so there was a question more directed towards, because Mallory talked about butterflies. And um, it says that I previously thought that it uh, was helping nature by releasing butterflies um, into the wild, but then I heard that you shouldn't really be doing that. Is that true? Uh, that's a very kind of controversial type of topic, um, but one of the main things that we really want to consider is one, we don't want to introduce any kind of disease. A lot of times when things are brought up in captivity, um, they are a little bit more I guess, um, immune to some of the defenses and they become, or disease, I should say, they become hosts and spread them to the wild population that might not be able to defend against those diseases. Also, we don't want to introduce a species that's not native to that area because that har harms the native populations even more. So even though you're, you're helping because you're putting out a pollinator, sometimes that's not always the best thing if that pollinator isn't native to that area. Great. Um, Great. And uh, so there was also a lot of questions that kind of came in about um, herb gardens and veggie gardens, because I know during the pandemic, a lot of people started their own garden. So um, and, you know, what is really better? I mean, we we're always told that, you know, green lawns and greenscape is not necessarily as good as native native plants. But where do where do those different gardens kind of fall into all of that? Yeah, that's a great question. So I would say Anything is better than a lawn. Of course, a lawn is better than turf, you know, plastic turf. But um, I would say that you can have two different ideas complementing each other. So you can have a lot of natives and you can have them mixed with an urban veggie garden. And one thing that I found was as soon as I put in a native garden, my oranges, which used to be like, eh, are fantastic now. I mean, they, they're they some of the best oranges I've ever eaten. So I would say that um, it's a great idea if you want to have um, an herb and veggie garden to definitely have natives planted around it and maybe, you know, make the, the most of the garden into a native garden and put your fruit trees wherever you can or your, you know, your vegetables um, amongst them. So I think it's a, a good combination, a good way to be exercising um, permaculture. And um, I do have fruit trees as well as I have some kale. I have a ton of watercress that grows in the pond. I use the watercress for smoothies and salads and um, just other like quiches, things like that, casseroles. So I would say the combo is a great idea. Mallory I don't, and Dylan, I don't know if you have anything else you wanna to add to that. 
I, I was just going to say um, what you put on your garden, I think, is one of the most important things, too. Um, you know, especially for insects, we might be spraying our vegetables to prevent bad insects, quote unquote, but really that's also harming the beneficial pollinators and uh, going into the soil and, and messing with that as well. So um, I love, yeah, Judy, having a mix between things, I think is really great, but also making sure that we're harvesting um, as sustainably as possible as well. Yeah, no, that, that's like all, all great points all around, right? And I, I always love to throw out this, this is like my favorite slash least favorite little factoid about lawns is that if, if you consider uh, a lawn, a crop like corn, it's the largest crop in the US by a pretty wide margin. Um, we do use a lot of resources to maintain our green lawns. Um, it's actually pretty wild how much we use for them. Yeah, that's definitely where um, hopefully that people that are joining us this evening are starting to think about ways that they can kind of adapt their their yards or their spaces around their homes or their communities to help um, to bring back native wildlife that doesn't necessarily require as much water or maintenance um, because it's designed for here in San Diego. And so uh, this evening, you guys have all brought some really good tips for us and we really appreciate you guys being here tonight. Um, we just wanted to kind of give each of you an opportunity to just share once again um, uh, your your information on how people can maybe, if they're interested in reaching out to you about learning more about what you do, or if they have further questions, um, and uh, just any final plugs about um, what you're doing. So, uh, Judy, do you want to go ahead and start? Um, yes, so I, I wanted to answer this question from David Swanson about the manzanita. Um, so I just wanted to say the manzanita in my front yard is about 10 years old. I believe it's a Howard McMinn. Um, manzanitas are one of my absolute favorite plants. I love them so much that I have two walls in my house that are painted manzanita because <laughs> I love that color so much. Um, anyway, also fantastic um, wildlife plants. And uh, anyway, so I just wanted to address that. So I'm sorry, what else did you, were you asking me? Just um, if people wanted to learn more or any final plugs. So you had mentioned yeah. that. Yeah, so I would say um, to, to please visit California Native Plants or cnps.org and specifically cnpssd.org. We have lots of um, videos and we've had speakers over the last few months during COVID. Uh, we've had a ton of speakers and all of our speakers and their, their um, presentations are available. We also have a lot of resources that suggest different kinds of plants. And again, some of the easiest plants to get started with. Um, so I would encourage people to use those resources as well. Great, thanks. And uh, Ms. Mallory? Um, I went ahead and put um, the website that I kind of upload all my tips and um, tricks and those kinds of things on the chat, but also I really um, recommend SciStarter is a really great citizen science app that I think is really fantastic. iNaturalist 2, um, Judy recommended uh, Seek, which is a really, really incredible app for people who are just starting out. I know that's how I kind of uh, broke into that as well. And um, also projectnoah.org is a new one that's coming out. And uh, they're also having a nature school that they are kind of mingling into. So if you have kiddos, that's a really great uh, way to kind of get outside and start investigating as well. Great, thanks. And Dylan, any final plugs for you? Yeah, you can find me on um, mainly Instagram and YouTube underneath the name Dylan the Biologist because I'm Dylan and I'm a biologist. Um, but yeah, that's basically where you'll find everything I'm doing. Uh, right now we're actually doing a June biodiversity in your city iNaturalist challenge, just encouraging people to get onto the, their local parks and document as much biodiversity as possible. We're currently at like almost 800 species and 1500 observations in the last 10 days. So yeah. Um, Join in. It'll, it's just fun. <laughs> all that. So you can find all that on Instagram as well. All the info for that. Yeah, that's that's great. And there's also the City Nature Challenge that usually happens around um, Earth Day time in April. So um, all great ways that people can get plugged in and help out with nature. And again, thanks to everyone that joined us this evening for Second Nature uh, with the Living Coast Discovery Center. If you would like to check out any of our other 
former webinars or videos, you can find that on our website, thelivingcoast.org, or visit us over the weekend and check out our own native pollinator garden to get some ideas. Um, and thanks to our wonderful panelists who are here with us this evening. So thanks everyone so much and have a great evening. Thank you. Thank you.